kingdom. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. And now I'd like to welcome Pastor Will back up, who's going to bring us today's word. Thanks, Aaron. How good is testimony, hey? It's awesome. Hey, this morning we're going to start with the reading of Scripture. And uh, it's, it's important to me that we give good um, emphasis, that we give good honor to the reading of the Word. And you see, in, in times of Old Testament, it was the person who was delivering uh, the message that actually got to sit down and everyone else stood during the message. Now, I know some of you sometimes start to check the watches when I, when I get up because I, I, uh, I start to get a little bit excited and I lose track of time. You're the one sitting down. Imagine in the Old Testament times, these guys are reading for half a day, in fact, sometimes all day, uh, and it would be the, those that are listening that would be standing up. But let's give good honor and give good due. And I'm also going to invite some help and assistance. We're talking about time treasure and talent. And so this morning as the Word of God is read, I'm going to enlist the help of first ever. So why don't we stand to our feet right now. Let's honor the Word of God as ever comes to read the Word for us this morning. Two Corinthians says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Man, awesome. Thank you so much. You may be seated. That scripture there is the focus scripture for this month, and this month we're covering the focus of the whole year. We're, we're talking about over the course of the month, can we get the slides up please gentlemen? Uh, the power of one. Now, I believe there is incredible power in one. We're going to explore this all throughout the year and we're going to take this month specifically to have a look at it. Now, that scripture um, that Eva just read out, I think I've got control here. There we go. It says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. This is the guiding verse for this year when I'm planning out and preparing for the messages. It's all through the lens and the focus of Jesus Christ. And as we're at the starting point of the year, I believe that it's time that we take our focus and make sure that our focus and our lens and everything that we see and plan and seek is through the lens of Jesus Christ. And so I invite you this week as your homework, because reading the Bible, in fact, I've been told Eva's just got a new Bible and she's very excited about reading the Bible. So I believe she's going to join us this week in reading chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. So I'm inviting kids and big kids alike to read through 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this week. Because this bit of scripture here, it's seated about sort of three quarters of the way through chapter 5. Those two verses there, 14 and 15. And so I want you to understand a little bit what we're going to do today is we're actually going to explore chapter 5 in a little bit more depth because the chapter and verses were only put there for our reference to make it easier for preaching and for locating scripture. But when the Apostle Paul wrote the second epistle or the second letter to the Corinthians or the church in the location of Corinth, he didn't write it with chapters and verses just as you wouldn't write chapters and verses if you were writing a letter to people either. But he wrote it as one letter. So I want us to understand and read it, not as through the whole of 2 Corinthians. If you would like to do that, I, 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 I suggest that's a great way to read any of the letters, any of the epistles. But let's just look at it in context of chapter 5 today and, and go through that so that we can get the full depth and breadth and understanding of what this verse wants to say in and through us. So the start of chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, he says for us to think about our lives as tents, as temporary dwellings. 
And that's to be compared to the eternal habitation, the, the eternal accommodation, the eternal abode that God himself is building and preparing for us. And we can have assurance and guarantee that this is being done because God gave us of his very own spirit. Now understand this through the lens of Paul. Paul was what we call bivocational. That means he had two jobs. He was a preacher and a teacher, but he also had another job as a tent maker, 100%. Paul was a tent maker. He was intense. He started it, Chris. And if you read through any of the writings of Paul, you would agree that he is intense. The guy doesn't go by half measures in anything. And Paul would understand the usage of tents. Now, in those days, tents still were temporary dwellings generally, or they were extensions or annexes. A lot, often, tents would be put on the roofs of the houses, and, and men or women would go up there to pray, or especially during, during feasts, they'd put tabernacles or tents on their roofs to symbolize an important coming of Jesus Christ. And so when Paul's writing about us to consider our life in the temporary form of tense, he kind of has some idea, and he's writing based on his experience and on who he is. And this is where he's coming from. He's saying, understand it in this imagery. I understand it in this context that our desires and our wants and needs are temporal, and that is our body, our bodily desire. We move on to, to verse 7. And you might be familiar with this one. It says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. If you're wondering where that's located, it's a, quite a popular memory verse. I walk by faith and not by sight. It's verse 7 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we could practice that by getting blindfolds. And I've got some blind. No, I don't. We could get blindfolds and get everyone to stand up and start walking around and see how good your faith is. It would be quite funny until we got the hospital bill. Because I'm sure it wouldn't end very well. But, but what Paul's talking about, if we look at it in context and understand what's come before it, is that there's a very temporal side of who we are, and there's a very eternal side of who we are. And if we're wanting to walk according to the eternal... If we're wanting to live as if our life is eternal, and in fact it says that is well-pleasing to God if we do that, it says that we need to operate by faith in that way. So we move through from 7, and then we can come to 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So we can see here that these scriptures are compounding, and they're building upon one another. It's almost like a court case where the evidence is being applied, and it's stacking, and it's building a story. So first we understand that our our life on earth is temporary and tent-like in comparison to the permanent dwelling place that God is preparing for us. And we understand that in light of such that we should walk according to faith and not just according to what we see. Then we see that the love of Christ, which is shown in Christ dying for them, us, and rising again, and then we judge thus, which means that we, we, we now have our evidence, and we make our decision, we make our conviction, we make our opinion based on the fact that we understand in light of the love of Christ dying for us and rising again, and understand in light of the fact that what we experience and see is temporary, and that we are not to operate according to all that we see in the temporary, but according to faith, that then... As Christ, as one, died for all, so all should die to themselves, die to number one, which is me, and live for the one, Christ, who brings us all together. Continuing through as we see this keep on folding, it says, Then regard no one according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
And I wonder how much we regard ourselves according to the flesh. So if I understand correctly that Christ has died, I am no longer living in the sin, but his death has paid the price of my sin. I am now set free. So now if I tell a lie, I am not a liar. That is not my identity because I don't regard myself according to the flesh, but I regard myself according to the spirit. So that's not who I am. Is there anyone getting free here today who might be living in an identity that's not yours to have? But maybe we treat other people according to the flesh. You know that personal space that we all love, especially when we're on the road? And you've just had this faith-filled service and you're praising Jesus on the way home from service and then someone enters that space. And you try and point them to heaven with one finger, which isn't all that God glorifying. Because what you've just done is you've just reverted from the one into number one. My space has just been interfered with. Someone has cut me off. And I'm going to treat them according to their flesh, not according to the fact that actually they're a person that Christ died for. And their action is only tent-like and temporary. But they're an eternal person made in the very image of God. I just flipped off God. Hello. You guys are so much more holier than me here this morning. Anyone get road rage? I'm not saying that I've actually used the middle finger to point people anywhere. But I do get a little bit upset and aggravated when someone cuts into my space. And I, I, for me, I struggle with this a little bit. And as I've been preparing this message, God's reminding me that it's His Spirit that renews me and that I get to benefit from this today. And you guys do as well. Anyone going to get renewed by this message this morning? Has it started on anyone already? Praise Jesus. Because the old things have passed away and behold, all have become new. You're a new creation. That person that is ticking you off is a redeemed person. Jesus has paid the price whether they accept it or not. He felt them worthy enough to do that. Are you responding to them Christ-likewise yourself? And are you responding to them according to their Christ-likeness, even if they're not operating in that at the moment? Massive challenge there. That was verse 17. And it says that God has reconciled us to himself, through himself, through the person of Jesus Christ. There's chapter 5. I want you to read that this week and let that mess you up. And you see, I see these verses in, in 14 and 15 being a great summary of actually what's going on in the whole of chapter 5. But when we read it in that whole context, we're like... Wow, what it means for me to die to myself and to live for him just has taken on a whole lot more weight and content and context. And, and I'm maybe a little bit more convicted than just reading that and going, yes, yeah, sweet, this sounds great. Because of the love of Christ, my life and my response is compelled in love to be dead to number one and living for the one. Living for the Christ. And is my attitude, is my affection, is my attention resembling the love in which he gave and that I respond in right at this moment? So let's dig right into this now in light of all that we've done. Let's pick apart this bit of scripture a whole lot more. It says, if one died for all, then all died. If one died for all, then all died. He died for all that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him. The way I summarize that is one for all and all for one. Anyone heard that one before? 
One for all and all for one. Where have you heard it? Three Musketeers. It's the French version, and they kind of invert it. They usually say all for one and one for all. Now, interestingly, it's actually taken from Latin. Um, Shakespeare is the first one being seen to write it. They feel that maybe, scholars feel that it might have come before that, but he's the, the most oldest person seen writing it. Um, but in Latin, it's unus pro omnibus, omnus pro uno. Now your turn. I'm joking. One for all and all for one. The order actually makes it important, and it's the order that it appears in that scripture as well. It's because Christ died for us that we can now die to ourselves. It's not works-based. I'm not working my way into heaven. It's not because of my goodness, but because of God's. It's because of the goodness of God and the love of God that compelled him to move in love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, that's me, the biggest whosoever out there, would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. In fact... Unos pro omnibus, omnis pro uno is the unofficial motto of Switzerland. And the French, in the untwisted way, is on pour tour, tour pour un. Ha ha ha. Uh, Alexander Dumas put that in The Three Musketeers, the great French play that you are aware of. I'm not sure how many ha-has he did on it, but um, I just took some creative license for that. Now, around the room, you'll notice at the moment that there's these white bits of paper that are around there. And this is actually a direct symbolism of the one for all and all for one. So this is an activity that Alicia got us to do as part of our celebration of those that serve on team last year. And what those Christmas lights are made up of, of the thumbprints, the very DNA of the members that serve here in Connect Church, that are actually the light of this here community, of this church. It's when we come together and that we serve, that we actually create a picture. And you see, there's one body, one bride, one church that Christ is coming back for. It's not the churches, it's not this, that, and it's not the divided, it's the together. And you see, when we are actually understand that one Christ died and our all die into one, we actually bring this oneness. You see, each of our fingerprints create one image. And each of us, when we come together and serve, like Aaron gave us example of this morning, we actually form a picture of the cross that helps to bring people into vision and focus of their life. You see, Christ died for whosoever, whether they or we like it or not. Christ has already done it all, given it all, paid it all. It's finished, he said. So many people in this world, both in the church and out of the church, that miss the vision of the cross because we're not serving together in the right, in the right way or, or they've missed it themselves. And so I encourage you to rethink your actions on how you are reflecting Christ in your world. So that order, one for all and all for one, very important. Romans 5, 8. Anyone know that one? Whilst we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because one died for us, now we can die to ourselves. And it's not our own efforts and our own struggles. And I'm just trying to be good. I'm pretty bad at that. But through Jesus Christ, he's restoring me and renewing me. And by his power, I'm a new creation. And the old things have passed away. And I don't belong into that I identity anymore. 1 John 4.19 tells us that we can love God because of His love first for us. The order is critical and important because God gave, because of who He is. And so this is important now for us as we seek not to live for number one, but for the one. The Christ, the Lord, the Savior. And there's that wrestle because we come to church on a Sunday and say, I surrender before you, Lord. 
and it's just the drive home, whether the kids are yelling or that person invades our private space or whatever happens, and we shift gears back into number one and self-preservation, and uh, it's what I see, and so that's how I be, and that's how I act and how I respond. But it's the one who died for us and rose again that we live for. You've probably heard the saying, hindsight is twenty twenty. And now in 2022, we've got the beauty of seeing 2020 and having that as hindsight. And what it means, 2020 being perfect vision, is it's easy to see something when it's already happened. And I want us just to explore this a little bit more, that that concept of hindsight being 2020. I want you to... Consider, as we're looking at the cross today, as we're looking at the person of Christ, what it would have looked like for people at the time of Jesus being crucified, witnessing him on that cross. We celebrate the cross because with hindsight in 2020, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of God. The same power that rose Christ from the dead is the power that he's given inside of each and every one of us. But at the time, they didn't have the beauty of hindsight. Some of them had left jobs to follow the Jesus that was now being crucified and brutally murdered on a cross. They had emotional investment in a friend, in a teacher, in a son, in a brother. And we can see the journey even into the grave. And with sorrow, they approach looking for where the body of Jesus was laid to rest. And an angel says something so bizarre. Who are you looking for? But is it bizarre? Because whilst they didn't have hindsight, they did have the prophets And the prophets foretold that the Christ would suffer, but be raised again, that death would have no hold. David sang songs of this. The prophets foretold this. Jesus himself said, I tell you this now that I need to suffer, that you would not be in fear, that you would not be in turmoil, that when the time came and I was delivered up, you would have confidence and that you would see me resurrected. So when the angel says, who are you looking for? To the angel, it's like, dudes, you've missed it. When Mary's at the tomb and she's like, where have you taken his body? Presuming the person she's speaking to to be the gardener when it's fact, it's Jesus. And even us today, with the beauty of hindsight, how often are we coming, needing help, and presuming to be speaking to the gardener when it's Jesus himself there, and we've missed the total mark. We've missed the whole point of what's going on. We get this revelation, revelation moment where we go, oh, Raboni, my teacher, my Lord, my Savior. When we're not just... They're scratching their heads going, where is Jesus? I wonder how many of us lose Jesus in a church service. I wonder how often I've done that. In the busyness of preparing and in trying to preach good and in trying to encourage and in trying to worship. I've missed Jesus in the midst that he's just slipped through. We can miss it when our vision isn't set correctly. So when we look at the story of Jesus, we look in that, in that 2020, and I believe that this year, we've actually got to go into the year looking with actual 2020 vision, 2022 as well. In 2022, would you have 2020 vision too? Can you have 2022 vision this year? Can you actually go into this year not going, hey, how many people do you talk to out there that say, oh, it's going to be great once it goes back to normal? <laughs> Hello? Normal? Man, I don't even know what normal was then. I don't know what it's going to look like moving forward. I think that's going and looking into the future with 
complete. That's not faith, that's foolishness. But when we look with faith and we look with 2020 vision, we understand what's there, but we also understand its tent-like temporal nature. And if we're actually looking at the Christ who is eternal, that it would seem like he might be going to the grave, we understand in light of what Alicia was preaching last week, and maybe you missed something like I did. You know what? Her message worked me over all week, and I got completely undone. When you understand that we've got to be taken out of a pot and be planted, we're like, yes, Lord, plant me. I prayed that so foolishly last week until God started planting me. You see, when you're a seed, being planted looks and feels a whole lot like being buried. You see, when you're roots and you're being planted, it looks and feels a whole lot like being buried. And what looked like at the cross and the tomb of Jesus, him being buried, was just him being planted. I'm the fruit of the planting of Jesus Christ. And therefore, I'm to bear fruits in his likeness. One of Alicia's favorite verses is that we would be the planting of the Lord to be trees of righteousness. I'll tell you something that undoes me in the very end of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. The very last verse says this. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. In Jesus. There was a song, it goes, I can't can't even say it. But it talks about my righteousness. My one defense, my righteousness, my God, how I need you. For years, I changed the words thinking that it was completely abhorrent for me to sing of my righteousness. My one defense, your righteousness, my God, how I need you. To one day, I saw Jesus where he was and he upsided me on the head and say, my righteousness has been given to you and you live in my righteousness. You are the righteousness of God if you're planted in me. If you're not the righteousness of God, you're not in me. You have no part in me. Let me wash you. Let me make you clean. Would you be the righteousness of God, friend? Would your actions be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? These people had left jobs, they'd left things, and they just missed the planting of the Lord. But maybe the planting of Jesus is a foreign concept for you, but maybe you being buried is not. Maybe this week you felt like the walls were coming in on you. Maybe this week, this year, this last couple of years, you felt like you are in over your head. And you know what? If we're in a tense state, that's pretty fatal. But if we're understanding things from end to end, you see, friends, I need you to know something. Jesus Christ, Aleph Tav, is in Genesis 1, but he doesn't just stay in Genesis 1. He's there in Revelation 22, 21. The Bible starts and ends with Jesus, and, and that's what our life is made to do. Is, is to be completely seen in the light and the image of Jesus Christ. God made it to be the planting, to be his righteousness. Maybe you feel like you're in over your head. Well, I reckon when Peter stepped out of his pot, we call a boat. And the waters came in, and he's like, I'm in over my head. Maybe he can relate to your experience at the moment. You see, God called Peter out of a boat and said, come and walk on the water. And the first step Peter took was one of faith. And he stood on top of the water and was Christ-like, because Christ was on the water, and he was just copying Jesus. When you read the story, it says that he had his eyes fixed on Jesus and by faith was walking to him. It says, then he noticed. 
the storm around him. The storm was always there. Jesus knew the storm was there. Jesus was in the storm. It says that Peter noticed and his eyes went to the wind and the waves. Friends, when your eyes are on the wind and the waves, where aren't they? Yeah, that was right. I was going to get tongue twisted there. You've taken your eyes off Jesus. And see, what happens there is the next few steps, his faith petered out. Just leave that hang. You're welcome. And it's exactly the same thing that happens, friends, is that Jesus calls us out, and in faith we start to begin. But then the enemy comes and sows and seeks to bring fear that eats away and erodes and peters out our faith, and we begin to sink. Here's something that I'm looking at in a whole different light right now. Peter was planted. That the planting of Peter, what does Jesus respond? He says, Peter, where's your faith? Because verse 7 In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, I walk by faith and not by sight. And friends, the storms are there. Jesus knows it. But it doesn't matter when he looks in the eternal view and you're seeing in the temporal. If you take your eyes off the eternal Jesus Christ and look at the wind and the waves and let that be your focus, your planting will be your burial. It will be fatal. Your anxiety will rise. Your fear and your sickness will carry you and coffin you. With your eyes on Jesus Christ, it's simply a planting. And I believe that day Peter was planted. I believe that things happened in his life that would never be undone. Because I walk by faith and not by sight. And you see in Peter what we see in each and every one of us, the tension of number one and the one. Is when we come into an environment that self-preservation kicks in. Bing! We're driving. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. What are you doing? Bing! We've gone from the one to number one. When the kids just do something. Bing! From the one to number one. Because self-preservation. And our eyes come off the Christ. I walk by faith and not by sight. You know, friends, Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us without faith it's impossible to please God. But this is something that will give you the ability to carry through 2022. I want you to get cross-eyed this year. You see, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. And if you keep one eye fixed firmly on the cross, when you keep one eye firmly fixed on the cross, things take on a whole different context. Now, earlier we were talking about blindfolded walking by faith differently. If we were just to walk around by faith cross-eyed, there'd be a whole lot less carnage. But for us to actually operate in the world when we're not actually of it, when we appreciate and understand the full eternal context of it, we've got to be cross-eyed. We've got to be looking to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Satan has a plan to see you ripped off and living less than. Satan has a plan to bury you. Satan had a plan to bury Jesus. Guess how that ended up? For my good and for his glory. Hallelujah. Every time Satan wants to bury you, God will use it as a planning of the Lord that you would be the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Can anyone believe that today? Every plan of the enemy to bury you is defeated in Christ Jesus. It's already done. You're just being planted. And you prayed for that last week. Hallelujah. I'm just explaining what you got yourself into. Defeat, failure, disappointment, struggle, job loss, health deficiencies, broken relationships. Man, that could just be last week, right? But when you're looking at Jesus and when you're cross-eyed, it's temporary and God will carry you through. 
You see, Jesus never denied the fact that the storm was there. He just put it in its place. And in fact, used it for the good of Peter and for the glory of God. Friends, don't stress on the storm. I want want us to be praying for those that are suffering and affected by the effects of COVID. Whether they've lost jobs, whether they've lost health, whether they've lost peace. There are people that have been directly impacted in in numerous ways as a result of a virus. Jesus doesn't say the storm's not there. It's as stupid as saying, let's go back to normal, (laughs) right? There's something going on. People are being affected in very real ways. So we pray for them with our eyes on Christ. What did Jesus do whenever there was things that were coming up against him? There was people that were demon-possessed. There were people that were afflicted and impacted in so many ways. What did he do? He healed them. And he, he calls us to cast out demons, heal the sick, preach the gospel. So right now, why don't... Why don't we just lift up every single person that's in our circle, whether we know them as friend, family, community, workmate, school friend, everyone that's been touched as a result of this virus, and we're going to believe for the breakthrough of God. We're going to believe for the the eternal to overcome the temporary. Heavenly Father, right now, we thank you for your power to move. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, would you be predominant and dominant? Would you move on our behalf? Lord, I thank you that you're our provision, you're our health, you're our provider, you're our shield, you're our all. And we live for the one, not number one. For everyone that is in fear or is struggling with self-preservation in any way as a result of this sickness, this disease, this virus, this plan of the enemy from the pit of hell, Lord, I thank you that this is simply a planting and not a burial. We pray for your faith to overcome your people and for those that are coming into your kingdom in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to continue praying. We've got a number of our members that have been um, come up with a positive return, having COVID at the moment or have been impacted in some ways. And I pray, I ask that you pray. You pray with us. We've got members in this church and this community that have lost jobs as a, as a result of COVID, either in, in work hours dropping or in a choice on how they pursue vaccination. I ask you to pray for them. We've got people that are suffering from all sorts of things. I want to give you, just as a finish off this morning, because now that we've understood that verse in the full context, I want to give you two examples, one in the Old Testament, one in the New, of two lots of siblings that showed what the difference of walking by faith and walking by sight is. And the first one we can find in in the book of Genesis couple of brothers by the name of Cain and Abel. Anyone know Cain and Abel? You heard of Cain and Abel, kids? Heard of Cain and Abel? Awesome. Story of Cain and Abel. It says that they came and they brought an offering before God. And it says specifically of Abel's offering that he brought of the firstborn of the flock. It says that he gave the fatty portion So he gave the best of the best of the best, sir. When it speaks about Cain's offering, it says, And Cain came and brought some of the fruit of the field. And it goes on to say that God approved of Abel and his offering, but did not approve of Cain and his. And what we see play out next is Cain murdering Abel. God even warns him in between. He says, Cain, why are you angry? If you didn't well, would I not be well pleased? But now beware. Sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. And what we can see the playthrough is that Cain came and brought whatever. Abel came and brought the best. And we can see the reaction and the response of Cain. He doesn't get frustrated at what he did and what he gave and try to give better. He tried to correct the injustice and took out his brother. Are you bringing your best or are you giving the rest? I ask you to stand right now as we get Levi to come and and read out um, Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42. 
This is the last scripture reading. Home stretch, guys. Look at that. This is Mary and Martha. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain man, woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was too distracted with serving and approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered to her, Martha, 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 you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good path, which will not be taken away from her. Thank you, Levi. Martha, Martha, Martha. One thing is needed. Not number one, but one, the one, the Christ. Friends, the one. When you come here, you can give something. You can be all Martha, 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 all worried about this and that, but one thing is needed. In your life, you can be troubled and worried about many things, but one is needed. The one is needed. The one is needed. And I believe that today, if we get cross-eyed, the corrective lens of the cross will actually bring us in to seeing rightly and giving a good offering and acting in the right way. The righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that we would be trees of righteousness. Mary chose the better part. Mary chose the best part. Abel gave the better part. Abel gave the best part. I'm asking today, are you willing to give? Are you willing to turn your eyes upon Jesus and be undone in the fullness of all that He is? Are you willing to come before the throne of Jesus Christ? Or perhaps get lost in perfectionism, dragging others into unnecessary religion. If you keep reading the story of Mary and Martha, the next time you see Lazarus, Mary and Martha, Martha is still serving. And Mary is still sitting at the feet of Jesus. Even after Jesus says that one thing is needed. And please don't be Martha today. Please don't be Cain today. I believe the Lord is saying that one thing is needed. I believe that today the Lord is saying, give your best part. Stop seeking for number one. Start seeking the one thing. One thing is needed. The one is needed. The one is needed. The one is needed. Are you seeing people in the love of Jesus Christ? Are you seeing yourself? You are redeemed. You said yes to Jesus. It's done. Stop beating yourself up. Let the love and blood of Jesus cleanse you, make you clean. Heavenly Father, in this place today, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, take our eyes from the things of the world. May they grow strangely dim as we look to you. Turn your eyes. Turn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Look at Him this morning. Turn our eyes to you today. Come on, sing it.
declare it today with 2020 vision. These things, these temporal tents, the walking by faith is happening. The walking by sight is denied in the name of Jesus. As we walk in the light of your glory and grace, today we declare that I will be the planning of the Lord. That I say, yes, Lord, plant me. Lord, bury me to be the planting. Take the circumstances, the situations, the hardship. And I surrender to you and I keep cross-eyed today and every day. This year, 2022, is the year I keep one eye on Jesus Christ the whole year. I allow my life to be transformed by the power of God. The Word of the God renews my mind. And I see the renewing of God in the life of those around me. The things of earth grow strangely dim. So today, transform my life. I pray in Jesus' name.